Wonderful. Thank you everyone so much for joining us today. I am so very excited to be here. This has been, I feel like a long time coming, but I mean, Dr. Eric is fairly, fairly new to my life in the last number of months. And I am just so immensely um, appreciative of his presence in our community. So um, my name is Deanna Hansen. I'm a certified athletic therapist and the founder of Fluid Isometrics and Block Therapy. And I'm being joined by my nephew, Quinn Castellane, the VP of Block Therapy and a lead block therapist and our very special guest, Dr. Eric Robbins, a urologist, pelvic floor specialist, and co-author of the book, Your Hands Can Heal. And Dr. Eric has been a massive voice in our community, sharing insights on healing emotional trauma. And we just have so much to talk about today. So I'm just going to pass it right over to you, Dr. Eric. Thanks. I'm so excited. Guys, thank you so much for having me and hosting me. So um, yeah, my background, as you said, as you said, I'm a urologist and um, I'm kind of a, a regional chronic pelvic pain specialist. So I get sent really challenging cases kind of from throughout uh, our organization. And um, you know, of course, with all the patients, we do the medical standard of care and all the normal tiers. The thing is, we've got other really good specialists in my system. And so a lot of times the patients come to me and they've already had all the standard medical things and they're still having chronic pain or problems or, you know, functional issues. And so for all these years, I've kind of just been interested in, in looking outside the box to find out what are ways to help these people. And um, most of my stuff is centered around mind body healing. And it's so interesting because people initially, they hear, oh, somebody does mind-body healing. They think that the doctor is going to tell the person, you know, the problem's all in your head and you're crazy and making it up and there's nothing really there. And actually that couldn't be further from the truth. So the gist of mind-body healing is that, um, you know, early life stressors, early traumas, things like that, put our body and our physiology in a fight, flight, freeze, stress state. And uh, things like the ACE study, the Adverse Childhood Experiences study, show that these early traumas, even actually dating back to the womb and probably transgenerational, affect how our body and our physiology runs lifelong. And so uh, these Adverse Childhood Experiences program how the physiology is going to run. And in essence, we can be stuck in a fight, flight, free stress state for years or decades. And then that basically affects people's health. So for example, with chronic pain, uh, a couple just physiologically, a couple of the biggest things going on, there's usually a lot of nerve hypersensitivity. So um, I'll give you an example. I had a guy recently and he said, Robbins, you know, it's severe pain. He'd seen a bunch of other people. He said, it feels like there's a red hot nail jammed into my pelvic area. You know, and we, of course, we did the exam and had x-rays available and all this stuff. And I said, listen, sir, the question's not whether you're having pain because you know you are. But obviously, we examined you. There is not a red hot nail there, but that's how it feels. That's the message that's going to your brain. So that's an example of nerve hypersensitivity. So I told this guy, problem's not in your head. You're not crazy. You're not making it up. But these nerves are lying to you. They're sending a false or magnified message there. Um, we'll see people sometimes, I mean, with chronic pelvic pain, sometimes people have to urinate every five or 10 minutes, you know, and we check them and there's no infection and no tumors and they're emptying well and all the standard stuff. And again, the, it, that's a nerve hypersensitivity issue. So then at a higher level of truth, you ask, well, why would someone's nerves be hypersensitized to begin with? And that usually has to do, I believe, with folks being stuck in a chronic fight, flight, freeze, stress physiology. And the stress hormones play a number of factors. They sensitize nerve fibers and pain fibers. That's a biggie. They cause more inflammation in the body. So you can, I mean, we all know what that does. They affect how well the immune system works. You can think of things like either people getting sick a lot, the colds and the flu, or they have autoimmune diseases. Um, it increased stress, as you guys well know, increases myofascial tension, which brings me to the second major thing that contributes to chronic pain, that really of any sort. I mean, I'm a urologist, but this applies to probably as much to chronic headaches as chronic abdominal pain, to, uh, you know, chronic, to fibromyalgia, to all these things is there's areas of myofascial constriction and contraction of the body, you know, and I always tell the patients, you don't need to have done 14 years of schooling to realize if your muscles tense and tight and contracted all the time, you know, there's less blood flow, there's less oxygen, the metabolites build up inside. Again, you don't have to be a specialist and athletic trainer to realize if there's a nerve and the muscles clamp down on the nerve constantly, 
that's not going to be very soothing to the nerve. So um, all, all mind-body healing is basically all based in physiology. It's shifting folks out of a chronic fight, flight, freeze, stress state. And um, it's down-regulating, it's calming the nervous system. And it's getting these areas of myofascial constriction and contraction to relax. And then that puts the body in a state where it's better able to heal itself. Thank you. That's uh, such a, a great overview of what's going on in the body. I think so many people yeah. are confused, you know, like, um, as, as you said, I, I can't imagine if I had gone to the doctor and, and I was told that, you know, your pain is in your head and yet you feel this, this intense yeah. pain and, right. and, and you don't know where to turn. That must be, right. I mean, that would only add to the whole <laughs> symptom and all right. the additional pain. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, it, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So you have shared about TRE and you actually yeah. took me through one of those sessions and it was really amazing. Can you talk a little bit about that for our listeners? Sure. Um, if I may, Dan, I just want to give a little bit of background to kind of put it in context. So um, I had pretty severe chronic fatigue syndrome from about age 15 to 45, probably longer than that. Uh, my mom had it. My sister had it. Um, they were both on disability in the state of Texas. It's really hard to get disability in Texas. They were on it. Um, I can remember literally every day growing up, coming home from school and finding my mom home sick in bed, you know, and um, we took her to a bunch of medical specialists at that time. That was probably more in the 60s, 70s, 80s. They couldn't find anything physically wrong, per se, on labs and x-rays and exam. And, you know, she saw some mental health specialists and they said, well, she's not crazy. So, you know, there, there's actually so many functional illnesses and problems that probably fall into that category. So she had it. I kind of swore to myself I was never going to uh, accept that diagnosis, but clearly I was severely run down and depleted all the time. You know, if my wife was getting stressed, she'd hop on the treadmill and kind of, quote, sweat it out. And if I tried to exercise, I would just get way more depleted. Um, I had a tremendous amount of brain fog. You know, I remember... Um, it was really tough getting through residency. Our, we had a, I was at USC and our residency was considered one of the most intense there was. And it was every third night call for a long time. And I can remember like you come in at 7 a.m. on Monday and you work all day Monday, all night, all day the next day and you leave at, you know, 4, 5, 6 p.m. And it's truly a 36 hour shift. And sometimes you don't sleep during that time. So by 10 a.m. on the first morning, it took every bit of willpower I had to force my eyes to stay open. And it, yeah, I mean, I don't know how I did it. It was kind of probably grace, but um, yeah. So it was, I had it for a long time. Um, and I initially studied energy healing to try and find ways to have more energy. And I learned some techniques that uh, were somewhat helpful. And some of those are actually in a, a book I co-authored called Your Hands Can Heal You. Um, I studied some other things, um, but the long and the short of it is what I, what I can say now in, in hindsight is that my body clearly was stuck in a fight, flight, freeze, stress state. There was a lot of myofascial constriction throughout my body. Um, I saw a, a bioenergetic psychologist back in 1997. And at that point, I had hit, uh, hit a, a, a time in my life. I was just completely stuck. I couldn't, in every part of my life, I couldn't go forward. I couldn't go back. I was just stuck. And this bioenergetic psychologist and those guys, they're psychologists, but they focus on energy flow in the body and libido and life force, whatever you want to call it. And he told me, he said, Eric, you're getting by on 3%, which I, I'm pretty sure was true. So then you look at that and you say, well, how do we, what do we do to get out of that? So many patients have fatigue and so many problems. What do you do when you're stuck at 3%? And so what, what components make up that 3%? What, what's happening? So, um, what I, what I came to realize, not really as part of that therapy, it wasn't that helpful, but um, is that all of us are nervous systems like a, a plate. And you, everyone's heard that expression where people say my plate's full, right? And so the model is our nervous system's like a plate and it can only handle so much stuff coming at us from, we can only handle so much coming at us from life before we have too much on our plate. And when life exceeds, your plate gets too full, when your neurologic stress threshold gets exceeded, it creates this generic stress anxiety response in the body. And then we all learn to respond to that differently, depending on how we learn to cope as kids. So some people isolate themselves. That was a biggie for me. I just shut off everyone and everything and text messages and 
email and I, he collapsed, you know, um, some people are angry all the time or anxious or depressed. Some people engage in any one of a number of addictive behaviors and you can name it, eating, drinking, sex, gambling, shopping, everyone's, you know, or distracting behaviors where you're just constantly on your cell phone or playing video games. But all those are secondary to getting pushed over that threshold. That's number one. The second key learning is that early stressors and traumas, again, starting from the root, starting from the womb, probably transgenerationally affects the size of our plate. So early stressors and traumas can literally give you a super small plate. So I always tell people, one of the reasons I'm pretty good at this stuff, my plate was the size of a thimble. Okay. And so again, I didn't know it. All I knew is how I felt. I mean, I don't know, Quinn, how you feel, you know, but I mean, I said so that that was just my life experience. So um, I was constantly getting pushed over a threshold and having all this bad behaviors and emotions and feeling like crud and being sick. So uh, my healing really came when I started finding ways to get a bigger cup or plate. And, um, uh, and one of the things that was most helpful to me was learning the TREs. So um, in 2014, I was, um, in addition to the chronic fatigue, which I could somehow get by with and was getting a little bit better, um, I, I started having some very serious neurologic problems. I had really weird symptoms to the point I almost couldn't function. And, um, you know, with all due respect to my, your, to my neurology colleagues, you know, they don't do a particularly good job if you have some sort of chronic debilitating neurologic disease. So I wasn't too, uh, wasn't too motivated to see a neurologist. And then I noticed like if I ate uh, dinner after six or 7 p.m. at night, the food would sit undigested in my stomach. And then um, the straw that broke the camel's back was I was at work one day and just out of the blue, my heart started racing at 220 beats a minute, getting dizzy and lightheaded. And I got admitted to the hospital and um, it's scary as heck. And um, I was in the hospital and the hospitalist came by the round and he said something to me and trust me, it was not one ten thousandth of the clarity that I now understand this stuff. But I got the idea that, oh, I'm stuck in a fight, flight, freeze stress state. Before I'd read it in a million mind body things and understood it as an abstraction and a concept, but I was living in a hospital bed and petrified and it was about three days from having to just leave work um, from this. And then the second thing I realized is that, you know, even though we always say our, the body tends to heal itself, right? We say that. It, the body doesn't do a particularly good job healing when it's stuck in a stress physiology. So at that point, I was desperate. I'm praying. I'm like, God, show me a way to turn this stress switch off. That's when I discovered the TREs. So um, the gist of the TREs is this. Um, I'm sure everyone's seen on TV or YouTube or something like the lion chasing the gazelle. Everyone's seen that. The gazelle's running, you know, and trying to evade capture. It's literally running for its life, isn't it? And but what's interesting, if the gazelle escapes and gets to a safe place, what it will do, its body will shake and shiver and tremor. And that shaking, shivering, tremoring mechanism seems to do two things. Number one, it seems to turn off the fight, flight, freeze, stress switch. Now, we as humans are not very good at that. You know, we have stresses and traumas. We get kind of PTSD, which, by the way, is not just for folks who fought in a war or we're horribly abused as kids, but it just means our physiology has gone into a fight, flight, free state. It's staying on autopilot. And we see all the manifestations of that. The second thing I have, and when I explain this to patients, I say, I want you to imagine one minute the gazelles eating the grass grazing. And then, you know, that cheetah creeps up and then bam, in a half a second, it's running 50 miles per hour and zigzagging. And there's a lot of charge and survival energy building up in the musculature. And it's almost like if you take a can of soda, yeah, by case Diet Coke, shake it up. Now there's a lot of pressure in the can. Obviously, we don't want to just uncork it real quick and spray soda all over our nice living room. But what do we do? We just start slowly uncapping the lid. And just We start slowly, safely letting that charge, that survival energy out of the body, out of the musculature. Um, my understanding is that when you don't do that, that, that leads to these chronic muscular tension and bracing patterns that keeps making the muscle want to come back and get stuck. So this guy, David Berselli, Dr. Berselli, he's, I think he's got a PhD in social work and he's also a bioenergetic psychologist, came up with these exercises. 
and it activates a shaking or tremoring mechanism in us. Uh, the exercise is usually started in the inner groin adductors. And in my experience, and in my experience teaching probably 2,000 patients how to do it, it does those two things. It, over time, seems to downregulate the physiology, seems to shift folks out of a chronic fight, flight, freeze, stress state. And it also, over time, as the tremors move through the body, it seems to unwind these chronic muscular tension and bracing patterns so the muscles are less likely to keep clamping down. So uh, it was, it was life changing for me, gave me a much bigger plate or cup. So over time, this was not a one week overnight or one week or two week or one month process, but over time I went from a thimble to like a, you know, 64 ounce big gulp, which is pretty good. <laughs> I just want to say the fact that you did and accomplished what you did with a thimble, that alone is really impressive. I remember back yeah. in my twenties when no I kidding. was, um, you know, I was, uh, drinking to excess and I was functioning with a hangover pretty much every day. Yeah. And when I finally, you know, came to realize like, what would I actually be able to do if I didn't have this chronic pain that I'm forcing upon myself? And, you yeah. know, that's when this whole process began for me when, when I stopped that, uh, negative behavior and, and started yeah. opening myself up to, you know, not feeling so crappy on purpose every single morning. So um, mm -hmm. but isn't it amazing when you suddenly have that influx of energy and you get rid of all yeah. that stagnancy and I just see it as being, you know, such a function of being able to access the diaphragm muscle because pain, fear, and stress cause us to go into that free state. So yeah, it absolutely. just keeps compounding over and over again. And then, um, and, and then we're locked and, uh, yeah. And, and it's just so lovely how you share in the community because as people are going through block therapy, for example, um, you know, these things are coming up to the surface and it can be scary as you know, and, and to, uh, have you as a voice there to, you know, give additional tools and help guide people. And there's just no question that having a doctor, um, you know, giving, giving feedback, it, it's, it's a beautiful feeling of safety for all of us going through this process. Yeah. 100%. What is that Ram Dass quote? He said, we're all just walking each other home. And so, yeah, it's been a, it's, the block therapy has been so life changing for me. And um, it's just one of those, you know, Robin's five star mind body approaches. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I just, I'm happy to give back and you've got a great and very intelligent, and very involved community with actually some of the, you guys, uh, the administrators provide just some of the most awesome support I've ever seen on the Facebook group. So hmm. thank you. Ah, well, our pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> and and and, su and super quick, Eric. Just a few people are asking, yeah. what does TRE stand for? TRE stands for Tension and Trauma Release Exercises. Perfect. Okay, that's yeah. what somebody put in the comments. I just wanted to confirm. But yes, yeah. can I, can I, uh, Deanna, mention something if you <laughs> wouldn't mind? So, um, yeah, Deanna, you know, I was we had a uh, I think a chat. I th think going actually on the the uh, Block Therapy Facebook group. And someone was mentioning, I think, COPD. And that's something I've watched. You know, we, I see, you know, urology, we see a lot of older patients. I have seen a number of them with COPD. Every single one, you say, take a deep breath. And they're high chest breathers. Their entire lower part of their chest, their diaphragm is not moving at all. And um, it's just profound. I, I, I do think some caveats, though, um, like in my case, even back when I was still somewhat frozen, I learned to do diaphragmatic breathing and you're right. It's life changing. Um, by the way, the diaphragm, uh, when it moves the, the pelvic floor also moves. And so as a pelvic health expert, we love getting movement more in the pelvic floor, the, Euro, the levators, the Euro general diaphragm. Um, but I was maybe, uh, better at, at diaphragmatic breathing than I should have because my entire chest was so locked up my inner cot. I mean, everything, you know, I used to get body work. I'm sure his body workers, you guys know that they, they kept saying, Eric, you're bound up. <laughs> Listen, that really pisses you off as a mind body guy. You're supposed <laughs> to have so much of your stuff together that you can't lie to your, but you know, your body worker. So I'm like, damn, it's still locked up. So, um, I, you know, I, I studied with a guy named Gay Hendricks. I love this guy. He was one of the early somatic psychologists and he's got some breathing techniques and attempts to open up the bio, up, attempts to open up the diaphragm. And then with more advanced stuff, he wants you to breathe into your kidneys and breathe into your pelvis. And he's got some nice stretches to do that. No doubt. He's a phenomenal person, but block therapy takes that so many more levels because people just don't realize, I mean, how much stuff we store in our intercostals and, you know, even like our front, um, 
our pectoralis minor tendon, which is pulling everything forward. And, and um, I just recently started, uh, I know you prefer people block the front of themselves generally first and open that up and start lower and move higher. But I just started doing my, my middle and upper back ribs. And again, that was this newfound sense of freedom. I could not believe it. And it, you know, there's that expression that says, you never know how stuck you've been until you've been set free. And block really does enable one, again, not as an abstraction or concept, really does enable one to, to actualize that in their own life. Yeah, my breathing was so much deeper. And then it's almost like I had that freedom for the first time in my life. And, um, and then you go back and say, like, how many breaths do we take an hour or a minute or a day? And every dog on breath, I'm fighting that myofascia and block has just opened that up so beautifully. So again, mm-hmm. thank you guys. Oh, that is so wonderful to hear. Um, I, I think it was in one of my books that I said, you know, if you had only a million breaths in your lifetime, how would you choose to take them? <laughs> Slowly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but I mean, you, you would, you would choose to, you would choose probably also to take them easily, but it's like, you don't know what you don't know. And we all each know how, I mean, we all just know how we feel. And I'm telling you, I, as someone who's almost 58, I mean, I've been walking around a lot of decades with this just locked up myofascia. And again, you don't realize how good and free you can feel until you, until you do. Mm, but, that's a um, very good point. Yeah. It's just what you found and the body of knowledge that you've discovered. That's the other thing, Dee, if I, if I may address this. So um, my son, Jonah, actually introduced me to block therapy and um, he, Jonah gets intuitive hits every now and then. And um, when he gets a hit, it's usually a, a hit. It's a real thing. And so he, he said, Dad, will you try block therapy? And um, so the first night I did it, I just put it under each calf and for a few minutes and then on my quads. My quads, historically, when I get a massage, are very, te- very hypersensitized. And I just remember after that having this, deep sense of well-being and this this energetic charge coming up but this deep sense of well-being it wasn't like a fight or flight you know overstimulation and i really realized there's something to it and i was talking to dr Berselli, who developed i was having a session with him after that and a couple things happened i even though i've been doing tre for seven years and it has been life-changing um I still had a substantial parts of my body and my myofascia that were just stuck and frozen. And TRE is good for moving through the body and releasing a lot of that, no doubt. Um, but I still had substantial areas where my myofascia was stuck and I needed something stronger than just having the tremors, the TRE tremors move through my body. And um, the, the block therapy interventions for that were fantastic. And I remember I had a session a couple weeks before with David Berselli did block for 10 days. I had a second, another session with him and he couldn't believe how much stuff had opened up. I mean, stuff that had been frozen for the prior seven years, but it was interesting what he said. So he's a bioenergetics guy. And this is also a Deanna. Again, I know your background is as an athletic therapist and I don't really know how much somatic psychology you ever studied, but from the very start, when I learned block therapy, since I am a mind body guy, I could immediately see the applications for that immediately see it. So I was talking to Berselli. He was uh, pretty amazed at how much my myofascia, my legs had opened up. And he said, interestingly, in bioenergetics, um, the earlier the trauma, the earlier developmental stuff actually causes contraction further down in the body, particularly the calves and feet. Now, you, you also talk about that. And I know, Deanna, you have a whole body of knowledge around this. It's not just one day block here, the next day block here. There's actually a body of knowledge and an order and a sequence to what you do that was really interesting to me because I don't think you've studied somatic psychology and somehow intuitively you figured out you have to release the legs and calves and, and, and feet first. And um, what Berselli would say is um, you open up, especially energy channels in the feet and calves and the energy flows were allowed to feel, it allows us to feel more grounded. And um, as you, when, when Berselli says the word grounded, it's not like, I mean, we all on the mind body field here a hundred times a day, every, everybody's offering a course on getting grounded. But I mean, what Berselli means is actually you can feel your legs, you can feel your body supported 
you you're moving energy from the ground and you can't do that unless you open up those energetic pipelines. So, yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. And actually, you know, what was really interesting um, when, when Quinn and I just ventured into this journey, the very, one of the very first programs we had was called the 21 day block blitz. So we decided to do a little test through Christmas. So it's a 21 day program. And through the Christmas season, we had, I think it was close to Quinn, I think 80 plus people going through this with the goal for weight loss. So, you know, using the Christmas season and, and getting people to simply block, and it was a 15 minute per day program, not doing anything else. And it was really amazing because the majority of the people improved in their size and shape, even though they were also indulging through the Christmas season, oh, but wow. there was a few, yeah, but there were a few that hadn't. And a couple of them lived in Winnipeg. And I was like, well, how come all of these other people had these, you know, um, wonderful results and, and these few didn't. And so I had a couple of them come over. And when I scanned their body, it was so obvious to me. It's like, ah, their calves are locked. You know, mm. the, the locking of the calves is twisting the pelvis. It's not giving them that accessibility of the diaphragm. So um, I don't even think, Quinn, at that point, we had heard about that study um, in Australia where the majority of weight loss comes through proper exhalation. But no, no, that was probably like three, four years ago. And oh, when wow. we did that 21 day block blitz challenge through, you're talking about the one through Google Hangouts. Yeah, yeah, that, that was ancient. That was that was probably you were 17. 19, I think. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that was, that was seven years ago. Um, but that was pretty much the aha moment when wow. you really realized the legs, the lower extremities, the feet can literally bind and hold the rest of the body out of alignment. Because once we started doing that, people started changing so much quicker because you don't really think about that. You're like, well, I have too much excess weight around my lower abdomen, my low back or wherever it is. So yeah. let's block and lengthen those areas. Yes, absolutely. You need to do that, but you need to understand the concept of cause sites, pain sites and your foundation. Um, and, and even what you mentioned about grounding, but like actually feeling the floor, feeling the ground. What I find, found really interesting, I started working a lot in my upper back my neck, my rhomboids recently, because I work a lot, of course, in the front and the sides after I, cause I had a bit of a vagus nerve injury from bodybuilding years and years and wow. years ago, and it will still kind of come back here or there. I got so deep into these areas. I was telling this to Deanna on the weekend. It was bringing this new energy I've never felt all the way down my legs into my feet. And I just felt way more grounded there too. And I'm like, wow. So that was clearly one of those areas that I couldn't get deep enough because it was so dense that once you open that up, my whole rib cage is breathing differently because you yeah. even mentioned like, Hey, I was a diaphragmatic breather, but my upper ribs were kind of locked. So now yeah. I can feel my entire rib cage is starting to expand even more and more and more. So that's again, what I love so much about this. It's yes. we're the one in control. We find our areas. Once we have a really good understanding of this and our yeah. body, we find our most dense areas, release that. And you're just going to keep improving. You're going to keep improving. And you just yeah. feel like, I didn't know I could feel this good. I didn't know I could feel this good. And you're going to keep getting to those next steps and those next levels. So um, yeah, sorry, going back to the, the block blitz. <laughs> Yeah. And, you know, I think what's really interesting too, is when I'm, when I'm doing assessments on people, um, often what I'll see is uh, women in particular, um, they'll be very tight in the legs and they'll be ballooned in the upper body. So when I reach out to them and I'll let them know your, your legs are your cause sites for what's going on. And then the response is what my legs are my favorite area. And it's, it's like this mindset of a hard body, right? Like yeah. we think that if, if tissue's hard and it doesn't jiggle, um, that's a good thing. It, you know, it's, it's one thing when we contract it, it's a very different scenario when it's relaxed and, you know, all of that pressure and tension creates that ballooning in the upper body mm -hmm. and the inability for there to be that, that transfer of energy. So um, yeah, there's, there's been so many aha moments along the way since that, that first time that we did that, that block blitz. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you, you really have developed just a body of knowledge and it just integrates bioenergetics and kind of energy healing. And, you know, I think the, the biggest thing that blocks the flow of energy in the meridians is myofascial constrictions and contractions. Now, of course, when you, as you alluded to earlier, 
when you release those, um, what sometimes will come up to conscious awareness is the same memories, uncomfortable emotions, sensations that made the myofascia freeze to begin with. And so I know, uh, Deanna, you've been, been uh, working towards having more resources for folks on the website to deal with that. But yeah, block therapy to me is definitely a mind-body modality. It's an unfreezing modality. Unfreezing is good. Um, it is important, of course, for some people with a lot of trauma to go very slow. And again, I know you're starting to address that a lot on the website and um, just open it up for just such a, even a wider, uh, wider range of, of audience. Yeah, it's, it's fantastic. Yeah, we're going to be adding, um, and thanks to you as well, uh, you know, I'm an article that you've written for us, as well mm -hmm. as I think we're going to take some little snippets from this call so that we can, you know, add in more resources and just give people that, that deeper understanding that this is expected and normal. I think yeah. a lot of it is just knowing what's to come and knowing that it's a part of the process and you're not alone. And, you know, mm -hmm. most, if not all of us have gone through it to some extent or another and, uh, and, and that there is um, a solution on the other side of it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's finding that balance. We, we, it's bad to be frozen. You know, it's bad to be stuck, obviously. And um, so we do something like a block therapy or a TRE that does give us a bigger container. Fantastic. But again, uh, there is a little bit of a price to pay. On the road to unfreezing that stuff, you have to learn some strategies for dealing with some of the uncomfortable uh, stuff that comes up. Would you be okay if I address a couple of those things here? Is that okay? Please, yes. So I'll give you actually a perfect example. So I started, as I just told you, blocking my um, my back ribs. And, you know, I think we the more repressed stuff is, it's, I think we tend to hold it in our back. And so I started um, blocking those back ribs and I started having some subtle junk come up. Now for me, almost before I'm consciously aware of what's coming up, little anxiety, I'll immediately project it. So my big, I'll project it on my wife, Linda. And, and uh, you know, she's, she's an awesome, awesome person. She spends her life doing spiritual service. She has the biggest heart. She's not perfect, but she's pretty uh, amazing person. Um, anyway, but I immediately start, I notice I start projecting and I'm thinking she's doing this and she's not enough here and wish she'd be different in here. Then I'm getting agitated now. 20 years ago when I was doing some other stuff that was uh, way, was way less effective than the block and the, what I do now, um, I, I had some uncomfortable feelings and sensations come up. First of all, I was very good at repressing it. For the longest time, I would just shove it back down inside and then have more back pain. So when I started doing stuff to unlock the back, started studying, starting, started studying some of John Sarno's stuff, I'm like, huh, why don't we explore what's in the back? And I wonder what I'm ang angry or anxious about that I'm not wanting myself to feel. So then strong emotions started to come up, but they were immediately tied in with these thoughts. So I'm, what I'm explaining now, I have had to slow down a million times, but uncomfortable sensation. I immediately have a thought about it, usually about Linda. I think bad things. And then I'm like, God, if she's that bad, I've got to get out of the marriage, you know, and, but then I can't do that. I don't want my son to be raised by a single parent. I want to split the money. My parents were divorced. I swore I'm never going to be divorced. And then in a minute of a second, I started having all these thoughts about why I couldn't allow the emotions in. And then I was having panic attacks. So clearly that did work. One big break for me back then was I finally started saying, listen, let's slow it down a little bit. I had been meditating for a while. So I said, I developed this, this motto. I said, I can trust the truth of what I'm feeling as raw sensation without attributing a why. And then the panic attacks up. So I still felt like crap and horrible and anxious, but I just wasn't projecting it on her. And so over time, I gradually got better and better at noticing very uncomfortable sensations, but not necessarily attributing a why. And so I think, you know, what a lot of these non-duality teachers have taught us is just that. And what we learn in, in pain management, there's so many cognitive approaches and so many of them are notice what you're feeling in your body and open to it. Don't repress it. You don't have to repress stuff and you don't necessarily, no, don't necessarily always have to express it. You know, like people are upset with their boss. They think, well, I really got to shove it down or punch the guy in the face. Neither of those are really good options. What if you were just to allow yourself to feel your truth without having a bunch of thoughts about it and adding a story and a meaning and just let that be there. If you're, if you're in an anger and a rage, 
notice those sensations and let them be there fully as sensation. Do your best not to attribute a meaning, you know, judging it as good or bad, trying to figure it out. A lot of our spiritual folks try to make it positive, cut out all that BS, just be with the sensation, keep breathing. Um, Deanna, as you have said so many times, so often freeze is associated also with a freeze in the diaphragm. And so remembering what even your teachings, Deanna, remembering when I'm going through my stuff, keep, just keep breathing with the diaphragm, let there be there what is, don't attribute so many thoughts about it. You can actually move through stuff much, much faster doing that. So recently, heavy stuff came up. I've just learned, took me 20 years. I've learned how to handle it differently. Keep breathing. Try not to expression lash and, and lash out. The other thing is, as an aside, every time I would lash out about stuff I didn't like, it almost, for some weird metaphysical reason, the behavior shows up more. And likewise, if I can just be patient and loving, and um, then the behaviors usually get better anyway. So, yeah. Breathing, breathing, when you're in the middle of your stuff, we all forget to do that. Uh, block, of course, trains that immensely. But again, it also opens up the upper chest and intercostals, which are so important too. If you're just diaphragmatically breathing like I was, because everything is so locked up here, there's probably got to be a balance. But yeah, open up all that stuff. And that's where pain really became, you know, such a friend of mine when I was, so after my years of, um, excessive drinking and then quitting, I was undergoing some incredible anxiety attacks because now I'm having to live my life <laughs> without the escape that I chose for Absolutely. most of my life. And the anxiety was so, I mean, you just explained it so beautifully because that's exactly how it happens. Like something happens and then your thoughts go and then like all these things. And you just feel like for me, I had the sensation of feeling like, like my cells were really ugly and, and acidic and rancid almost so yeah. how i coped with that and and again that initial time was an intuitive thing um but moving into the pain because the pain forced me because i mean i wasn't like pounding myself or cutting myself i was putting pressure in and holding mm. and then because of that you tap into the breath and so that's how this whole thing happened because the pain was such a gift because it took me out of that which was worse than the pain, which was the anxiety and the craziness that I went mm. to and, you know, all of the negative thoughts and the, the darkness, like it, it's so dark. And then yeah. with that pressure, it's like you're putting that little flashlight into that area that's been so, so dark and just not receiving anything. And then boom, it's like, oh, there's a little bit of light. And then you take a little bit more of a breath and then it's like, okay. So th then you realize the story, <laughs> the story that you've just made up. And <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Hey, speaking of light, I mean, um, I'm not clairvoyant, but I mean, you can, I think, see light in people. I think the fascia just plays such a huge role in mm -hmm. that. Again, it's, it's intimately related to just energetic. I'm saying this as a guy who co-authored a book on mind-body healing, and mind-body healing is awesome, and I still use it. But in, addressing the blockages in the, in the mild fascia are so important. You know, I see people doing Qigong. It's awesome. Uh, meditating, um, doing all sorts of practices. And what they're trying to do is unblock the energy to get it to flow better. And, you know, in, in, um, there's some books that I edited recently for another author. And um, he calls his teaching direct path spiritual teaching. So you cut out all the fluff and just get right to the essence of it. So the direct path teaching, I think, with unblocking energy channels, which is a higher level of truth, is doing myofascial work learning cognitive things to deal with the junk that comes up, learning how to just expand in our energy and hopefully our love and compassion and all those things, which is a lot easier when you're not feeling anxious and triggered all the time. And when you have a bigger neurologic container, a bigger plate, it's easier to be these spiritual ideals that so many of us spend years or decades meditating on and praying about and contemplating on. So yeah, I, I block therapy just ties so many of these other disciplines together in a way that um, before it was out, you just, I, I think, couldn't really tie them together effectively. And it just, you know, without being able to release those adhesions, holding everything together, you don't have the space. You don't have yeah. the space for, to increase. I mean, you can increase the size of your plate to a degree, but if you really want to expand and yeah. have that light shining through you and open up those dark spots, you have to create that space to get that blood flow and that life in there. Otherwise it's this 
burden that we have to carry around every step that we take. And, um, you know, yeah. it's, it's interesting because um, one, one of the things that I'll do is I'll fly people on my feet. So, you know, like, like when you're a kid and, and you're doing like Superman and you're flying. So, I mean, could and I, you know, we, we used to do that all the time when we were like playing around. It's, it's a really great way of getting deep into the hip flexors. Mm. But what's so interesting is, I mean, I've, I've carried up to a 300 pound person on my feet and that person was so much wow. lighter than a person that might be 180 pounds, but really bound in the rib cage. So oh, it's really wow. interesting, the concept wow. of weight, because, you know, it, it's really all about yeah. like, if, if we have the space, then like a balloon filled up with air, you know, it's, it's buoyant. It That's almost defies true, gravity, huh? but you take that yeah. air out and we become super dense and wrinkled and dirty. And then, you know, you, you, you're that much more connected to the ground, not in a positive way. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it's a super, it's a very, very interesting concept. Like even, um, I'm sure maybe all three of us have experienced this, but there's times where I'll block and I'll release a major cause site or dense area. I physically feel lighter. Well, I'm sure just after you're blocking, you're going to feel lighter, but why do we feel lighter? Because we're releasing that, that downward pull that's happening all the time. So we're always having to fight that. Yeah. I was just talking to a friend of mine the other day. He's like, it like I just feel heavy like how do you just sit like this like well if I'm just gonna say hey man like just sit up right like this he's like man this is like a back workout back exercise I'm not yeah. relaxed this yeah. is actually causing me like more anxiety like that's why you need to release the fronts the sides yes the belly the diaphragm the psoas those areas first and then we can start exploring into the other areas. But it, it, I think that just alone is an extremely interesting concept. And I almost want to dive more into that. Like, because someone who probably studies um, um, physics, not quantum physics, but um, physics, they're like, well, I don't know how that makes sense in a way, because it's just weight but maybe that's a three-dimensional concept. Sorry, I'm, I'm going there a little bit, but that would be really interesting if there could be like studies done to see if it actually does change your, I don't even know the correct terms. Maybe not density, it may, it's maybe like it changes the density or the yeah, how, yeah. Yeah, how much stuff's in a certain volume. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So you that know, would be really interesting to, to see and to research. Yeah, that's awesome. What, what, what you said made me think of like, you sometimes see these spiritual teachers, spiritual masters, and they're teaching a yogic or meditation technique, and they're sitting in full lotus. I mean, people don't realize, first of all, that hurts. It's very hard to even get into like half lotus. But by the time the guy's loosened up enough of his myofascia and released the trauma and the tension and the energy to even get into the damn position, they're like halfway to spiritual realization anyway. So I get, but there's so much, the guy just, after years and years of training is sitting in full Lotus. It's like, come on, man, you're, you've already done the work, whether it's this lifetime, you believe it reincarnation is last lifetime. The guy's already done the work to free up enough of the energy. So the energy of the Kundalini, whatever you want to call it, you know, has the ability to, to flow better and help them towards their goal. And even just some basic concepts like metabolism, you know, like I think we, we all mm. know that it is believed that as we age, our metabolism gets slower, but why is that? You know, gravity is constantly compressing us, adding those adhesions, blocking these cells from being part of our functioning. And so they aren't, they aren't taking the energy and they shut down. So our metabolism, like we don't, we don't have to feed as much energy to the body because maybe we only have 10, 20, right. 30%. And I always found it interesting that they said that we only use 10% of our brain. Like I actually believe we're only oxygenating 10% of our cells in general. Mm. So not mm. only the brain, but the rest of the body. And we are walking around as these heavy sacks of flesh um, and everything is a burden and gravity will grip and manipulate those denser areas and keep winding you down and aging you faster. And as soon as we can release that and we can not have gravity's effect over such a, a radius pulling us down in all these different directions, then we can move through time without accumulating the aging that is typically understood to be normal. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, all of the above. I concur, doctor. Yeah. All of the above. <laughs> all of the above. That, that 10% of our brain though is so fascinating. Cause I think, um, you know, I think 
everyone attribute, I mean, that 10% of our brain theory and classically people think like the brain's here, you know, but um, I think what the current research is showing is that 80% of our thoughts and emotions are actually coming from the body and the physiology. And um, again, you know, you want to, you want to think better and feel better. It's very important to, to, to open up the myofascian and downregulate our nervous system. You know, there was, um, you know, they talk about, we talk about like the vagus nerve and everyone nowadays, the big thing is the polyvagal theory, which by the way, I love. And I think for most folks, uh, Porges' theories are, are very clinically accurate. It's a theory, it's a model, but I found it to be clinically accurate with the vast majority of folks. So, um, but, you know, the vagus nerve, only 20% of the nerve pathways are from the brain to the, like the body and the gut, and 80% of it is from the gut to the brain. So, yeah, I think most of, I think, you know, it's so often people have, negative thoughts, negative emotions, these behaviors, like I just got to change what's up here. Listen, these head-based, mind-based practices are fantastic. I mean, I've been a meditator for 30 or 40 years and done a lot of stuff and I've done inquiry and so much stuff and it's fantastic. By the way, a few years ago, I said something in one of my videos and I, I dissed meditation a little bit, <laughs> just in a bigger context, like half my audience left, like I lost it. So listen, meditation's great. If you're doing mindfulness, any sort of meditation, it's awesome, stick to it. However, what we're trying to accomplish with meditation is stilling the mind and stilling the body. And I think you can accomplish that equally fast, probably faster doing some body-based practices, some somatic psychology practices, some you know, block therapy theory. Um, yeah, I think you know, stuff like inquiry is fantastic, but these brain-based practices to feel better, your goal is to feel better, to have more energy, to shift your physiology, you have to have to work with the body. That's what mm -hmm. I've come to after close to 30 years of, of working intensively doing a big mind body practice. Yeah. You have to work with the body. So I, uh, I a hundred percent agree because I started getting into more meditation probably about a year, just over a year ago and got like really into it because there, there was thoughts and I was kind of stuck in this frequency of that fight or flight where I'm like, I just have to keep going, keep going, keep going. And it wasn't allowing myself to rest. So meditation helped me a lot with calming my brain, but also I've been blocking for six, seven years on top of that. So the meditation seemed like it was exponentially helping me more and more and more. So before I get into a meditation now, blocking, even just your, your belly, your diaphragm, your psoas, just calming down that energy center, just calming yeah. down your breath, bringing you more to that parasympathetic state. It's, it's so much easier for you to get into a meditation and then start rewiring your brain. But as you mentioned, if it's only 20% in here and 80% is in the gut, it's, it's very, very challenging to just sit in a meditation and retrain your brain. Yeah. So, and we're never going to get to that perfect state either. It's like, ah, oh, we, we, we're still affected by energies and things happening all around us all the time that can slowly pull you back into a state. So that's why I think it's so important to make it a daily practice. I love doing my morning routine. I was going to say, I love doing my morning routine in the morning. I was going to say, I love doing my block therapy meditation routine in the morning because then it sets the day right for me. And I'll start working, of course, with the breath, but then I get into my major cause states and then I can get into a meditation and it might only be a 10 minute meditation, but just training your thoughts to more of the present future rather than the past present has been a major yeah. change for me because we're so programmed by our subconscious mind, our subconscious brain, just to be on, on, on autopilot, on a habit. And it's so easy just to get out of bed, go to my computer, make coffee, go to my computer. And I'm just kind of stuck in that. But as yeah. soon as you release the fascia, connect the breath, get into a meditation, then you can start creating more of a future that you want by actually planning it out. That's something I really like to do is, okay, what do I want my day to look like? What am I not going to do today that I've been more reactive to in the past? I'm not going to get mad about this. I'm not going to hold this tension in about this. And that's why 
activating the breath first thing in the morning is amazing to sustain throughout the entire day because it's that that much easier to process emotion and bad energy that enters you throughout the day because that's inevitable we're, we're we're not living in a perfect world so jana always explains we need to focus on the exhalation that will take care of the inhalation and it's not just from an ox oxygen standpoint it's from an energetic standpoint as well if i'm having if someone's confronting me about something and i'm just holding my breath like this, I'm going to start storing that in. And then I clench more and more and more. And now I'm trapping it deeper and deeper and deeper into my cells and into my tissue. But if I'm just able to process it, understand what they're saying, but exhale it out in the moment. So I'm not storing it in. It's like, okay, they're saying I need to change this. Okay. I'm going to contemplate that. I'm going to sit on it, but I'm not going to store it and trap it. So that's why I really love the combination of the two block therapy, meditation, for me is just magic. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so uh, Dr. Eric, is there anything else that you would like to share with our community that we haven't covered yet in our discussions? Let me see. There probably is. Yeah. I um, hope so. Yeah. Let me see. I'm just going to look through the comments here as well. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, people are really liking this conversation. A lot. So our, our community knows you. <laughs> so yes, they're like, they it's, yeah. so, it's so great Eric. to hear you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Love this. You're so interesting to listen to. Dr. Eric could listen to this all day. Extremely informative. I've been doing the first five days of the 90 day challenge feet and calves and have already felt a difference in the pain on my right side, back, thigh, psoas. Very cool. So when would you use TRE? And when would you use block therapy? Is That's for you, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> oh, did he freeze? Oh, he froze on us. Oh, we'll just... I was thinking he was waiting for me to answer. And I'm like, <laughs> no, it's for you. <laughs> we'll just wait a sec here. <laughs> there oh, you're there back. we go. Oh, there you go, Eric. Hi. Hello. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> So um, I, I don't know the last thing you heard, um, but a lot of really good comments. People are, are yeah, loving glad. the conversation. Yeah. Um, so a question is, so when would you use TRE and when would you use block therapy? Um, I think they go hand in hand. Um, I like both. Um, Yeah, I, 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 I mean, I feel, I kind of feel like at this point, you know, first of all, I've been doing TRE for seven years and block therapy for seven months. Um, TRE is what saved my life, took me out of that chronic fight, flight, freeze autopilot. And I mean, I was stuck in that. I mean, I felt like I was dying. Yeah, so, so TRE is really down-regulating my physiology and started releasing enough of the fat, a bigger plate. Um, and again, when you do TRE, it's not just here, tremor, and that's it. There's a set of cognitive learnings. That's what we're trying to bring to block therapy as well. How do you deal with these emotions that come up? What strategies actually do work? What is not that useful? I mean, obviously, people can do whatever they want, but um, what strategies are useful in helping process those emotional things and memories that come to conscious awareness, realizing that, you know, of course, we want to practice in our scope of practice and do things safely. But um, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I say do both if you can, you know, as Deanne, I just taught you how to do it. And I, what I do and what I teach patients is a quickie version. Um, you don't need to spend a lot of time doing TRE. Um, in my experience, TRE kind of uh, down regulates the nervous system a little better. But again, after a long time of doing it, I still had substantial areas in my body where I was stuck. So I would say do both. But there's, in my experience and opinion, there's no substitute for TRE, period. There's not a substitute. Um, I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I would say do both if you can. They kind of do slightly different things. Uh, TRE downregulates the physiology better. I don't have an idea how it works. You know, David Berselli talks about central pattern generators and in the spine and brain. I have no idea how it works. I just know every mammal has a similar <laughs> mechanism right. and that it, it does work. 
And, and how long typically is a session with TRE? Um, so depending on how um, I have in my brain and I write about this, some folks just, just, we know, we, I know where everyone is on the Porges polyvagal curve. I have a pretty good idea looking at their physiology, getting a little bit of history from them, looking at their, their medical history. They have chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, autoimmune diseases, chronic pain, severe hypertension, um, really bad irritable bowel syndrome, things like that. Um, or they have a significant history of depression, anxiety, bipolar, PTSD, trauma. I already know they're, they fall into the sensitive, fragile category where there's a lot of freeze in their body. I know that. And when everyone walks in the door, because I've been doing this a while, in my brain, I kind of know where they are and where their physiology is. Um, I mean, a lot of times when I open the chart before I've even met the patient, I can look at their list of diagnoses. And again, I know where they are. So for that group of people, which is a big cohort of the folks that I see because of the nature of my specialty, um, I go very, very slowly and safely because I don't want to unfreeze people and unfreeze too much too fast. So um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I start people off very, very slowly. Um, I kind of modify the exercises. I've got some videos actually, if folks, want, if folks are at all intrigued by this video, T-R-E and me. And the other is called um, how I uh, do T-R-E with sensitive and fragile clients. To be honest, not tooting my own horn, but I think those are actually some of the best descriptions of what actually works in a real world mind-body therapy practice by someone who's done it, you know, um, and talks about how to go slowly and safely and talks about the Porges polyvagal model and how I actually use it in a medical practice. So if you're interested in what we're discussing here, go check that out. Um, anyway, so for folks that are sensitive and fragile, we start off and go very slowly, just like I think you guys are, are doing. You know, Some people, even though 20 minutes is a conservative period of time to start off with, for folks that fall into that category, start much slower. It's okay to just do one or two maybe body areas and go for less time. Um, realizing that when you're doing these unfreezing technologies, whether it's block or TRE, that it's not like the emotions, memory, sensations necessarily come up during the session. Could be after session, the next day. Sometimes it comes up as unsettling things in dreams or any kind of anything along that range. Wonderful. Super now, you, um, Eric, you froze a little bit just when you were giving the okay. two links to where oh, people sure. can find your stuff. Yeah. And, so and even what I can do, I can also just grab the links after the call and I can put them right in the description um, sure. in this call as well. Sure. So yeah, the names of my two YouTube videos, I've got several, but one is called TRE and me and explains a lot of the same stuff we're just talking about here and a lot of uh, understanding the Porges polyvagal model or theory really in, in its how we use it, how I use it clinically in a mind body practice. And then the other video is called um, how I do TRE with sensitive and fragile clients. And that's basically how we work with folks who are physiologically frozen in mostly in that dorsal vagal parasympathetic state. That's not, by the way, as you guys know, that's not the rest and digest good, happy uh, ventral vagal state where everyone's healing themselves and social engagement. This is the bad, parasympathetic, the collapse, the immobility, the feeling hopeless, helpless, depressed, um, that type thing. The chronic, where a lot of folks in chronic fatigue are. Wonderful. Um, um, Quinn, is there anything, any other questions before we wrap up today? Got a couple more here. <laughs> this is a funny comment from Rachel, but I'll, I'll just summarize it. By mentioning to people how block therapy can get you into deeper meditation than just through meditation has kind of rattled people a little bit. But that's why I think it's just important for you to test it for yourself because that's how I've gotten into my deepest meditations has been through actually having a prop to connect into my tissue, into my cells, into my breath, because we're physical and we're spiritual. So we have to understand that we have both. We're not just yeah. a spiritual, then what's the point of being here, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Like I said, meditation's phenomenal. I just think that if you look at your goals of meditation, which is to quiet your body, mind and quiet your thoughts and emotions, and hopefully uh, get a bigger container so you can handle a lot more stuff 
from life without being stressed and anxious. And you can actually achieve those spiritual goals of being more patient, loving, and uh, have more joy in this and that. I, I just think you have to work with the body. So I would never tell anyone, don't do meditation. I've been doing it for close to 40 years. I just think if you, if people objectively look at what their goals are and the types of people they're wanting to become, that it's very helpful to also include uh, some somatic work. Mm -hmm. And just from my perspective, I mean, I fully agree. When I was suffering with my anxiety, I couldn't stop my brain from going crazy. I needed to have that pain to connect into for me, which is how this process all began. So it, it's, it's a bridge. I mean, that's all that it is. It's a tool. It's a bridge. It's, it's uh, it, that, that's really it. Um, and and it, it does, it's, it's simple. And that's the beauty of it as well. I mean, I think most things in life that are really valuable are really simple because they yeah. should be. If they're really, yeah. really complicated that only a few people can understand it, then what's the point? <laughs> we all yeah. want to, we all want to heal. We all want to, you know, be the best versions of ourselves. And then collectively we can do the best that we can for everybody involved. Mm -hmm. And, and another thing, um, is that what I, again, love about block therapy is we're the one in control of the pain. We're not depending on someone else because I'm sure we've all gotten a massage. Um, and when you're in pain and it's someone else working on you, I'm more reactive. I tend to hold my breath. I'm like, okay, hey, yeah, that's yeah. not feeling too great. So that's why it's all about going at your own pace. And we always instruct that your breath is your guide. Yeah, it's, it's self, it's self-regulating, you know, which is kind of the, the vogue term it's just learning how to self-regulate and like you said manage your own pain and the depth that you can go and yeah it's a, it's a way to learn self-regulation a mm hundred -hmm. percent um another comment here love all this dr eric rocks great discussion and totally agree on addressing the body as a meditation teacher once i added yoga getting back in my body was amazing tre is fantastic somatics etc block is my gold standard thank you um, I'm new to block therapy and I've done mindful mindfulness for a number of years. I think there's a real parallel between the two when on the block, you're in the moment with the breath, with the breath as con as the constant, when you find a pain spot, you don't rush it or actively try to change it. You stay and, and leave and leave it happen and leave the process happen with ourselves as observers. I love it. That's a really cool way of putting it. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wonderful. Thanks. Um, please post link for Facebook on videos. Yes. So I will be posting uh, those two videos that uh, Dr. Eric Robbins just mentioned, and I'll put that in the description. This is also going to be on our YouTube channel. So um, everything will be posted below there as well. So those are all of the questions and the comments. So uh, Dr. Eric, I just want to thank you so much. Um, our, our whole community is so grateful to all that you do. Um, I, I know that you definitely create a level of safety, another bridge for us to move forward on our healing journey. And yeah. I can't thank you enough. And I would love to have you back again soon. Thanks yes. so much. Thanks so much, guys. It was, yeah, it, it was great being here. Yeah, and it's Block has just done so much for me personally, my son, Jonah. We're about to get my wife uh, into it at some point soon. So yeah, thank Wonderful. you. All right. Well, so thank you everybody you. For, for joining us as well. And uh, Quinn, if you just want to end off there. Yeah. So this, if you're watching this on Facebook, um, we will let you know when our next podcast is, but this will be, this is recorded and it'll be uploaded to our YouTube channel. So if you do have any other questions for us or for Dr. Eric, um, please leave it in the comments below. I'll also attach our Facebook uh, community group. That's very powerful. Um, there's a lot of respect in there for doc, well, Dr. Eric Robbins and everybody. So if you have any questions for him, that's another great place to reach him. Other than that, that's everything. Thank you so much for tuning in and we will see you all on our next discussion. Bye everyone. Bye. Thank you.